we've, we're very conscious and very aware that an online digital approach to work and to education and our programs is not necessarily fully inclusive, but digital skills and English language skills are, are going to be key to accessing those opportunities. Cybernetization, we're not talking, we're not only talking about the environment aspect of the matter. So in our point of view, sustainability fashion has to consider three main aspects. The first one is the social aspect, the environment aspect, and the business aspect. We've just got to come back and ask the question, what is the point of a fashion week? It's where it's become going to become really tricky because we need to see almost what is left in six months time. What's independent small stores around the world are still trading? How many small labels are still looking to actually come to Paris, Milan, New York, London to actually show their product? Preparing all materials uh, for digital, just in case we cannot see the buyer in person. Good afternoon, fashion lovers. With the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the creative industry, especially fashion, has become one of the most affected. And well, the fashion industry in this past few years has shed some spotlights for collaborations, especially when it is related for in the subject of sustainability and inclusivity. And honestly, in all honesty, actually, British Council has opened this path from years, I mean, probably Jakarta Fashion Week number seven, number eight, um, opened the path for this discussion to be openly discussed um, to make the collaboration happen. And so um, this is actually what becoming a constant discussion um, to really do good to the earth and, and to include um, everyone in this um, global situation to be part of the fashion. However, there has been reports that the challenge is to do something in regards to sustainability and inclusivity have found its challenge itself like even the use of reusable bottles in coffee shops um, are banned to minimize the risk of COVID. Or um, disabled workers are finding more difficulties to gain actual income during this pandemic because they are considered to be more vulnerable. So um, let's open up for this discussion, um, especially on this issue. Um, Clone, I understand that British Council has been highlighting and actually the forefront in promoting this very special topic, sustainability and inclusivity. How far is it or what is really British Council envision this topic can be stretched further in this pandemic time? I think I will say a little bit about the British Council's programs and the impact of COVID-19 on our work, especially in, in arts and culture. Um, the British Council really, you know, across all of our work, we focus on and embed inclusion, um, equality, diversity, and sustainability in all of our, across our programs work. And that hasn't, that hasn't changed. But one of the things I'll start off by saying is that um, the way we work as an organization over the last three months has changed. We're now working from home and the way that we've delivered our programs has gone online you know, through this webinar as an example. Um, and whilst there are certain benefits for us in going online, we can certainly reach a lot more people. I was involved in a webinar on Saturday that had 7,000 teachers. Um, we've, we're very conscious and very aware that an online digital approach to work and to education and our programs is not necessarily fully inclusive. And especially in a country like Indonesia, um, where you have well-connected uh, cities, 
and communities. There are a lot of remote and rural areas um, which don't have necessarily the, the technology, um, the bandwidth, the tools to, to access those kind of opportunities. So this is something that we're aware of and we're looking at both high tech and low tech kind of solutions to make sure that our work um, continues to be as inclusive as possible. I think also when we talk about inclusiveness in, um, in, di in, in the use of digital, we, in our arts and culture work, we have done a lot of work around um, making sure that disabled people have access to the arts and creative sector. It's a priority of ours. And so we're looking right now at how can we include um, to, you know, more initiatives to make digital programs accessible for people with disabilities. So we might try to have some sessions with people who can do sign language or make sure that we have subtitles um, and thing, you know, initiatives such as this. I think there are positives um, other as well um, in terms of education. Um, obviously, you can reach a lot more people. Um, but one of the things I've noticed, and this is an example I've seen in Australia, where they had a, you know, they're a bit further ahead in terms of connectivity to rural areas. It can mean that in the future, people who might be studying fashion, for example, uh, won't need necessarily to leave their hometown and travel to a big city to go to a face-to-face -face course in, a, you know, in an exclusive um, or a university or a private college they might be able to study that uh, and stay in their island or in you know, a more remote area and develop those skills and then be able to support their communities and you know, make an income for themselves without leaving home and having to go to a big city. So I think that's interesting as well. It's a, a, a whole, very interesting area. Just, I'll just touch a little bit around um, sustainability because sustainability is another big area for us, the British Council, in, through our projects. We will soon be launching a new program called Crafting Futures. Um, so this program supports the future of craft, you know, strengthening economic, social and cultural development through learning and access. There's increasingly a global interest, and especially in Indonesia, on climate change and you know, the economic models that we have around consumerism. We're interested to see how COVID-19 you know, is having an impact on people's buying habits and whether they're going to be more socially conscious and perhaps there'll be less of a throwaway um, you know, attitude towards um, products and clothing especially. So you know, we look forward to addressing these kind of issues through our programs, through our conversations, um, through this pandemic and looking towards the the lasting effects that it's going to have uh, in Indonesia and around the world after it. So, yeah, thank you for giving us a chance to kind of highlight these two areas. So, <laughs> Great, thank you. And um, Rahmat, um, maybe you can, I remember years ago um, that um, we went to London together and you were working with a Japanese manufacturer that is an exploration of a for the sustainable fashion. Okay. So maybe you can highlight uh, what is the status of that program and what okay. was like what was that you learned from that journey? Okay. So when talking about sustainability sustainability fashion, we're not talking we're not only talking about the environment aspect of the matter. So in our point of view, sustainability fashion has to consider three main aspects. The first one is the social aspect the environment aspect and the business aspect. So the collaboration launch between us and the Japanese, uh, and the Japanese companies started in 2016, have given us a lot of benefit in terms of brand awareness and then marketing boost. Also, of course, sales profit. So we, we get, uh, we get <laughs> you know, getting more brand recognition and et cetera. And then, but concerning about this COVID pandemic, of, of course, there are certain, you know, uh, changes that we have to make uh, in order to, to make this, project uh, sustainable. So before I, I talk about three, three aspects, the social impact and then the environment and also the business aspect. So uh, I think the, the second social and business aspect has to become key decision to adapt in this situation. 
So we actually had an inquiry. Uh, I want to share something. We actually had an inquiry from the police, the traffic department, to pitch underserved procurement using the sustainable fabric made by our Japanese partner because they know that the materials are superior, which have an anti-odor and antibacterial features because the traffic police, uh, you know, uh, doing the outdoor activity and then they feel that they body uh, make bad odors and et cetera. So they, they want us to pitch to them. But, you know, since March, there is no flight to Japan. Also, every shipment from Japan to Indonesia is, has been canceled. So we cannot, we cannot rely on this kind of, uh, you know, uh, global supply chain uh, model during the pandemic. So we, we ask ourselves, uh, is, is it how, how we shift our supply chain to local sources? How we, you know, uh, cope with the situation? Are, we, are, we, uh, are, are those uh, collaboration projects uh, robust enough to, uh, during the pandemic? So we question ourselves and then we, we, we talk to, to uh, the police traffic, traffic department that we cannot uh, follow the pitch and then uh, this is because during the pandemic and then uh, for E2, we, we, uh, we finally changed our uh, global imported products into local sourcing. Like we said before, uh, we finally met with Indonesian company from Sumatra. They are also uh, making a certified sustainable Piscos Rayon, which is 100% biodegradable. So we sift into the uh, local sourcing and then see what future will take us after the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, besides, we also, you know, produce more functional products and uh, B2B clients. And uh, we, are not, we are not, again, uh, producing uh, using push system. What does it mean? It means that we, we you know, spend upfront costs and then uh, selling what we produce to customers. And then suddenly this COVID, you know, making every stock unsold and uh, we suffer loss a lot. So uh, if, I, if I can share my uh, other presentation, we're actually making the uh, adjustment to our production. We introducing the on-demand pool system manufacturing where it's, it's in Indonesia, uh, we, we know that as pre-order system. So we only met when the sale has been booked uh, in order to minimize excess inventory and warehouse expense to reduce upfront cost needed. And in fact, customers are willing to pay 100% to us in advance. So, so this, is, this is very, you know, helping us during the pandemic. Uh, this pictures is actually our uh, uh, festival collection on May. And then we cannot sell it, we cannot produce it. So we open a pre-order system and then uh, luckily our customers are still having money to spend uh, to, to, to spend to, to buy our, uh, our uh, collection. And then uh, lastly, we also have a uh, strategy to make something like a two virtual franchising strategy where we will be focused on B2B. So uh, virtual franchise is basically a business model in which brand recruits resellers through an app or website where franchisee will promote and sell the business product service and recruit new franchisee in, to increase their commission earning. So why? Because many business has been closed, uh, physical stores closed, and then people choose to stay home. They want to save money instead of rushing to the weapon stores or malls. So uh, I am an uh, engineering graduate. I know that uh, graffiti will tend to pull everything to earth, but in retail industry, there is a retail graffiti where people uh, around vicinity, like for example, I'm in Jakarta, I prefer go to Pondok Indah Mall than going to uh, Carrefour to buy, uh, to, to, you know, to buy my, uh, my needs or, or everything because Pondok Indah have a retail graffiti that is bigger than Carrefour near my home. So, uh, by people, you know, staying at home and then isolated and then they, they, they tend to be, you know, saving their costs. Uh, we offer something like reseller system or virtual franchising where they can sell our products, uh, giving uh, word of mouth 
uh, marketing for our products to their, uh, their networking. So we hope that this kind of strategy can, can uh, help us to uh, cope with this situation. Thank you. Excellent. So this is you becoming the uh, the, the the modern of the multi-level yes. marketing where this, yes. the, the no it's it, it is not a multi-level marketing it's no it's, it's like, not you know <laughs> it is a modern version because it direct is, yes uh -huh. it's, it's direct, uh, direct and yet it, it is giving and it is one inventory yes. and yet reaching out um, and giving the relationship. To your franchisee, yes, exactly, indeed. exactly. Um, so, well, we're talking about Indonesian fashion label, and some of them are succeeding of going international, and both of you are the one that is um, succeeding of bringing Indonesian label to the world. And of course, part of it is Fashion Week, whether that is the fashion show itself or whether that is the trade show. Are that those are the one that is become that is um, part of you becoming the force of the global um, fashion force. And have you seen it? Some are rescheduled, but mostly, finally, um, made its piece to digital. Um, the, 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 it, it started with the Shanghai Fashion Week that in two weeks they really turned into digital. And now Milan Fashion Week is coming up in a week or two and London Fashion Week. So um, the digital Fashion Week, um, it's coming and then it's, it is real of, as, a, as a presentation of um, fashion. And um, well, the media itself, as the media are the propeller of the news about fashion, themselves are feeling torn as that is new ideas, but then it is not giving them the space of the physical interaction, the discussion, and the lack of the actuality on season collections to touch and to feel the collection itself. Um, so maybe this question goes to Toby is what is your thought about this? And well, London Fashion Week is coming up um, as digital, semi-digital, I think. They also have audience, but making sure that the digital is the major part of it. But we have seen uh, some Fashion Week already going force, uh, full force uh, digital. Uh, what do you see on this and what is the impact on the brands and how do you see this going forward? So I, I think it depends on um, the fashion week and it depends on its purpose. So um, obviously, as you've mentioned earlier, Jakarta Fashion Week is a direct to consumer, see now, buy now culture. <clears throat> um, and as a result, or more so than a business to business wholesale that say London Fashion Week or Paris or New York or Milan are, as a result, it's better suited to a digital platform because you're looking at showcasing and projecting um, your customer to a wider audience. As Colm has already said, you can, you know, literally rather than 500 people in a room, I can be doing that to 7,000 people um, around the world. So actually, it can work to an advantage from that point of view. I think it's not so easy when it comes to the wholesale uh, driven kind of business model. Um, that's where the challenges kind of arise. But having said that, if we have no stores left, then you have no traditional wholesale business model into traditional stores, although there would still be the digital stores. Uh, and as Ramat kind of points out, those kind of um, franchise digital kind of stores coming through. I think fundamentally, we've just got to come back and ask the question, what is the point of a fashion week? Um, and typically it is to showcase to a particular consumer base, whether that be trade or whether that be direct to the consumer, the new collections for a, uh, a business. Um, if, like I think will happen, is a lot of the bigger brands will basically say, and they've been moving towards this anyway, moving towards more or taking more care in their retail business rather than their wholesale, you would then see a traditional shift more towards the see now, buy now culture that people have been dabbling with over the past few seasons, but it hasn't quite worked out. 
<laughs> but take away a big order from Bergdorf Goodman's, take away an order from Harrods or a big order from Selfridges, and those orders becoming maybe smaller, then there's less importance on that wholesale. And it more becomes about what's in your control, which is the direct to the consumer model. So I, again, I think you're going to find, I had this conversation with about 12 years ago when Burberry first live streamed their uh, catwalk show. It stopped being a, a, a trade event and it became a consumer event. And no consumer wants to be told you have to wait six months from seeing <laughs> that product to being able to get it. <clears throat> and it was amazing to me that it took so long for the see it now, buy it now model to come forward. And I remember being in Jakarta and, um, and other uh, fashion weeks around the world where there was a real push to turn a consumer event into a trade event. And I remember saying to people, but hold on a sec, I think you're going to find that it works the other way around, that those big events start to become more consumer facing rather than trade. And again, I think this is just going to be the speed up. Um, what that also means for um, actual trade shows like White in Milan or Trinoy in Paris, um, that's where it's become going to become really tricky because we need to see almost what is left in six months time. What's independent small stores around the world are still trading. How many small labels are still looking to actually come to Paris, Milan, New York, London to actually show their product. Uh, and we just don't know. But if I go back five, six years ago, there were platforms like Le New Black. And Le New Black was a digital wholesale business to business platform that was trying to encourage young designers to kind of put up their collections and line sheets and lookbooks um, before anybody else was. Now, you might well find that it's difficult for a Trinoy to suddenly become digital and have everything overnight that a platform like Le New Black has. But if they were to partner with a platform like that, who already have all the digital infrastructure in place, then maybe there are these collaborations that can come together and they become the new way of showcasing. Um, let's not forget, there'll always be the argument that people want to look and see what they're going to buy, you know, wholesalers, you know, before they place an order. But that's exactly what Natalie Massonet was told when she came up with the idea of Net-A-Porter, that no one would buy a luxury product online because people wanted to touch and feel. Well, she proved them wrong. If you can't access the product through any other means because that product isn't available in a store in your local town, mm -hmm. then digital becomes the only means for which you can, you can move. And I, I think the creative industry is incredibly resilient. And most importantly, and I think has been shown by Lydia and Ramat, um, and also the British Council, is incredibly innovative. That is what we are. And throw adversity at creatives and amazing things can happen and new ideas, new business strategies, new way of working. Creative minds are always thinking about what's next, what's next, what's next, um, and, and very rarely standing still. So that's where I, I see, yes, okay, there's going to be a restriction or a constriction of the creative economy, but no one in that economy is going to be sitting still. Everybody's going to be looking at the new ways of working. And what I love about this for me, working with smaller businesses and smaller creatives, is that it will be with some of those smaller creators where they come up with a new way and the new delivery and they will become the establishment over the next 10, 15 years. That's not great news for the big boys, but I think it's exciting for those small to emerging designers that so often we are trying to support. Great, indeed. I think um, Jakarta Fashion Week, now I, I, we think of it is we're blessed as we are strategized as B2C instead of B2B. And with the leap into the, this digital um, era in a different way, um, well, even when you come to Jakarta the first time, when you were looking and we saw Pacific Place, we were already doing streaming. But the acceptance of streaming, the availability of, of broadband is not as much as today. And so, um, Streaming now is becoming a common thing, especially um, for the fashion lovers, which is more of the economically to have um, the facility of the broadband. And also um, the see now by now, we have been doing it about the same time as when Burberry's offered it. Again, the acceptance was 
far from it. Um, but now, uh, last year, it was a becoming a pre-order, a big pre-order for some of the designers we can see now by now. And with Rahmat's uh, presentation, how he adapted the situation for, um, for the pre-order on demand and even with agents or franchisees in his name, um, in the way he call it, that is becoming, I think, we are making, in a way, in these three months, um, we are making a revolution of what is really becoming a fashion market to the future. This will bring forth a new system of the fashion calendar. And we have seen changes of this landscape. I have to say there's a massive shift in the type of students I'm seeing coming onto my Starting Your Own Fashion Label courses that I do. Um, nearly all of them have a purpose behind the brand. And whether that's uh, a ethical purpose linked to labor, whether it's been a sustainable link to kind of process, but it's complete change from what I saw kind of in my early years where it was about, you know, being successful, fame and what have you. It, it's all about that. But this year, we need to closely observe the situation as it's uh, so many uncertain variables such as like country regulations on travel, whether there will be second wave coming, whether the buyers will be traveling or not. Uh, I think in, in the international scale, uh, in the international events, I think uh, online streaming of catwalk uh, shows uh, will be the new norm. We're seeing a trend across the world, in the UK, across East Asia, and here in Indonesia, that, and I think others have mentioned this on the call earlier, that what your brand and what your kind of social responsibility commitments are uh, to the environment are having a real impact on consumers' uh, choices when they're buying products.